listeners, and welcome to the NK News Podcast. I'm your host, Jacko Zwetslut, and today it's the morning of Monday, the 13th of December in Seoul, and it's still the afternoon of Sunday, the 12th of December in San Francisco, California, where I am joined via Zoom by writer and translator John Cha to talk to me about his unusual relationship with high-profile defector, the late Huang jang Yop, and his book about Huang and Kim Jong-il. Before we get started, please leave a review of this podcast. Secondly, check out nknews.org and consider buying a subscription that helps to fund the excellent journalism my colleagues put out every day, as well as this podcast. Thirdly, check out nknews.org slash shop for our North Korean leadership chart. You can see one on the wall behind me or a fraction thereof, uh, art posters, calendars, and more. Uh, as always, if you have any feedback, questions, or guest recommendations, you can send them to us at podcast at nknews.org. All right, so to introduce my guest properly, John or Haksong Cha was born in Manchuria in late 1945 and moved first to South Korea before the Korean War started and then to the United States after the April 1960 revolution that overthrew Syngman Rhee. He has since translated many works from Korean to English and written quite a number of books himself. In 2012, he published Exit Emperor Kim Jong-il, Notes from His Former Mentor, based on his extensive interviews with Huang jang yeop Thanks for joining us on the show today, John Haksong Cha. <laughs> Hi, Jarko. Nice seeing you here. Oh, thank you for having me. That's a great pleasure to have you here. A little bit about your background. You were born in the city of Longjing, a Chinese city on the border with North Korea uh, in, in Manchuria uh, yes. in 1945, just after Korea's liberation from Japan. Yes. Um, some of our listeners will be familiar with Seo De Suk, the first English language biographer of Kim Il-sung. He was also born there, as was uh, Yun dong Ju, the poet. Uh, and you ended yes. up moving to uh, America as a 16-year-old after your parents sent you there to escape possible persecution by South Korean authorities following your involvement in the 1963 overthrow of Syngman Rhee. Is that right? Yeah, it was Sailgu, uh, that's what it's called, and uh, it happened in 1960. And, you know, I was just a crazy kid at that time, <laughs> 14, 15, and I joined a bunch of uh, other students. Uh, on the streets, and uh, what you see now, you know, Sejongno, Gwangamun, that's where the action was, and right. we ran through that. And some of the kids, our friends, uh, they got shot, you know, and I, I wanted to continue to run across the streets and stuff, and my father said, no, you're not going to do that. Uh, he shipped me off to Hawaii. I was 15, actually, and uh, to a, uh, a relative uh, who had a distant grandmother in Hawaii. She was a uh, one of those, uh, you know, worked on sugar plantations in Hawaii. Uh, she was uh, she went there as a child in 1903. Mm. So anyway, I stayed with her, and that was uh, how I got to America uh, from sort of like turmoil to yes. the palm trees in Hawaii, <laughs> and it was quite a shift <laughs> in my life. I bet. Have you ever had the opportunity to visit North Korea as an adult? Uh, no, no, I haven't. The, uh, I got as close as, close as to uh, Yongjong, uh, pronounced in Chinese Rungjing, uh, my birthplace, and, uh, but I never crossed into uh, North Korean proper. Uh, well, of course, I was on my mother's back when I did that as a child. Yeah. As a baby, I crossed Tuman River and and now it's uh, Hantan River and old uh, 38th parallel. So right. I guess you could call me a uh, early, you know, Tagukja, I guess. <laughs> right. Very early one. Yes. Part of the, uh, the very first wave. Uh, now, almost 20 years ago, in 2004, you published The Do or Die Entrepreneur uh, right. about Korean-American businessman John Peck, and somehow that led you to a meeting with Huang jang yeop uh, Right, right. Before we get to that meeting, can you tell us in 25 seconds or less, who actually, who was Huang jang yeop 
Hwang jong yup was uh, North Korean. He was a very important North Korean official in the uh, Communist Party, and uh, he defected uh, in 1997 to South Korea. Okay, all right, that's a, a brief sketch. And tell us, how, how did you come to meet him through John Peck? Uh, Young Peck was a uh, businessman and uh, very successful. He uh, escaped North Korea during the Korean War and came over to the United States by himself, and he distinguished himself. He became a uh, steel magnet, I could say. It's a rags riches story. And I was writing a story about him. And one of the things that he happened to run across, uh, he wanted to meet his parents, uh, his mother and his uh, relatives. In 1994, in December of 1994, he gets a call from uh, General Zumwalt. He was the uh, Joint Chief of Staff uh, during the Nixon administration uh -huh. and asked him to be uh, part of the delegation to North Korea as the uh, American Economic Council to help North Korea. It was, uh, so he, he went to uh, Pyongyang in 1995, February 1995, and before agreeing to going there, as part of the delegation, he, uh, uh, you know, he said, I want to see my mother, uh, you know, and uh, if you meet that condition, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be part of the team. So mm. they said yes. So he went there. And what happened was they didn't produce her, his mother at that time. And instead, uh, who came along was, uh, was Hong jong yup He now, came why? along. Was he related? Well, he was, Hong jong yup was at that time was the International Secretariat. Okay. And he dealt with all the you know, international uh, affairs for North Korean government. Yeah. And he came along and requested for a meeting and said, I will uh, arrange your meeting with your mother next time. Hmm. I couldn't do it this time. So, he met, he met with the uh, uh, Huang, Huang and he came home. And uh, later he gets a call uh, from North Korea and said, okay, come on over. We'll, we'll, uh. So that's how he met Hong jong yeo And as I was writing uh, his biography, uh, Young Pak's biography, I uh, found Huang very interesting. Mm. And you know, he, I thought he could be, he should be part of uh, my historical treaties. That's, that's what I do. Uh, Korean, Korean history is so complex yeah. that I try to use individuals or personalities to describe what was, you know, going on to uh, right. reach the public. So anyway, I said, you know, wow, Hong is very interesting. Uh, so what happened was so young Pat came back and then he goes back to pyongyang and he makes a, he uh, you know strikes a relationship with huang and huang asks him you know to uh donate million dollars uh to the uh, republic north mm -hmm. korea and uh young was, Pat, was that for a specific project or just in general in general, okay, uh, and you know, Huang's he was his, as an international secretary. And his main job was to, you know, uh, bring in so-called investments uh, into, but most it, it just went to Kim Jong Il's coffers, basically. Yeah, sure. And uh, and Young Pak said, okay, as long as. Uh, my, you know, U.S. government allows it. I uh, will uh, donate a million dollars, and he wrote that letter, and and they let him see his mother and mm -hmm. his relatives. And so, uh, after Hong defected to South Korea in 1997, uh, they continued to meet, and I was part of that meeting. And, and then I decided to uh, write this book.
mm -hmm. about Kim Jong Il. Yeah. Uh, based on Huang's opinion or Huang's point of view. Right. As you mentioned, it was in February 1997 that Huang and his aide Kim Dok Hong were traveling back to North Korea from a trip to Tokyo, which yep. it's almost unthinkable now that high level North Korean officials were uh, traveling to Tokyo, uh, both that Japan allowed it and that North Korea allowed them to go. But uh, so there they were traveling back from Tokyo through Beijing when they entered the South Korean embassy in Beijing uh, and announced their intention to defect. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, Huang actually used that letter that Yong Peck wrote to him kind of as what evidence of what did he use it yeah. for in the embassy? Well, he uh, originally they were going to defect in Japan ah. and, you know, and there was so much, I mean, there was so much, uh, they were looking at, you know, so many, uh, bodyguards and uh yeah they were guarding him pretty tightly so they couldn't do it so uh too, when too many north page, korean bodyguards around him you mean yeah okay yeah yeah and he couldn't make the move and when he went to beijing he told uh boy so let's see uh, state security uh yeah. people who were in charge of you know guarding him uh told them this is what i'm going to beijing for to for collect the yeah, collect this million dollars. So right. presented that letter uh, that Young Pack had written. Right. So so they said, okay, go ahead, go to Beijing. Yeah. But you know, this was all prearranged with the uh, uh, actually South Korean NIS intelligence right. people too, and so they knew what to do uh, when uh, Huang came to Beijing. Yeah. So basically, Huang uh took that letter presented to him and got the permission to go to beijing and uh he and kim dok kong said they were going shopping they went through a hotel and went the other side uh back door of the hotel uh, i mean the department store yeah and they picked him up and brought him to south korean embassy that's what happened yeah ah. now some people call huang jung yop the father of of juche ideology uh, yes. Is he actually the father of Juche as it's practiced in North Korea, or did he become that when he came to Seoul and kind of reinvented uh, Juche? Oh, actually, uh, Kim Il Sung asked, or Kim Jong Il, I should say, Kim Jong Il asked him to uh, write this Juche ideology. Uh -huh. So he and his scholars, you know, the uh, uh, got together and wrote out this Juche philosophy. I'm sorry, I'll, 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 it's Kim Il-sung who uh, asked him because Hong, you know, he studied in Moscow University right. and he was the first uh, uh, student at Moscow University philosophy department. And so he wrote Juche ideology based on, you know, what he learned in, in Moscow, the philosophy and and he really thought he was going to create uh, a utopia mm -hmm. in, in North Korea when he wrote this. And uh, what happened was he, Kim, Kim Jong-il took this writing, uh, uh, the uh, document, yeah. and transformed it into a governing document. And he wanted, he wanted a theoretical background backing for his own uh, administration. And Kim Jong-il uh, just changed, revised, redacted things. And uh, by the time he finished uh, uh, messing with it, uh, it, it was not recognizable. So, so Huang was actually sidelined in a way, it sounds like. He was, and he was very, uh, uh, he was very upset about that. But they did the create a Juche did. Institute, didn't they? There was a sort of an institute for the study of the Juche philosophy. And, and Huang, yes. he was boss of that, wasn't he? He was. He was a boss of that. And they would have conferences mm. uh, in Japan. And he would conferences in, uh, of course, Pyongyang and, and Beijing even. And uh, uh, he did travel to educate right. others about Juche philosophy. But... Uh, what we know as Juche document today 
and what he wrote, two different things. Yeah. So is, was, his, what, was what he was doing, the work that he was doing for all those decades, was it actually something uh, substantial and meaningful in North Korea, or was it more cosmetic, more part of this um, external relations? As you mentioned, he was in charge of the, uh, the foreign secretariat and in charge of relations with overseas groups and bringing in investment and bringing in pro-Juche groups from other countries. How would you describe what the importance of his role was in North Korea? Well, because he gave, uh, you know, theoretical uh, backing for Kim Il-sung's Juche, and he actually believed that Kim Il-sung, you know, uh, had understood his Juche philosophy. Uh -huh. But actually, he later found out that Kim Il-sung really didn't. <laughs> And he found out that Kim Il Sung didn't read anything, of course. And you know, he, he talked about Lenin and so forth, but he actually never read uh. Lenin either. And uh, so, but he he did provide a theoretical background for, uh, you know, to Kim Il Sung's legitimacy, right? And also Kim Kim Jong. Ill wanted the same thing for his own uh, administration, and he used it to perpetuate the uh, the regime, basically. Yeah. What's your understanding of Juche philosophy? Is it something different from communism or socialism, or is, is it compatible with Marxist-Leninist principles? Is it something that runs alongside it or underneath it? How does it interrelate there? Well, I'll tell you what uh, Mr. Huang told me, and Juche philosophy is uh, based on humanity, humanism, mm -hmm. and it goes beyond what Kant or uh, Locke wrote, and he revised uh, some of those uh, philosophies, and he, he did, he wasn't crazy about Marxism, he was more uh, human. So he wrote this philosophy, anthropotropic philosophy. I mean, this is new, uh, as far as I can see. And it's a uh, uh, more, and he brought in the Korean uh, traditions, and the Korean point of view mm -hmm. into the uh, uh, philosophy. Uh, and he called it, called it Juche, but Kim Il Sung, apparently, he mentioned the word Juche for the first time, but he, uh, he really didn't know what he meant. Mm. And until Hong actually defined it for him, basically. <laughs> now, in your book, your subtitle, you call Huang Kim Jong Il's mentor. But yeah. It, so it sounds like. Uh, as you described earlier, that uh, that Huang had an idea and Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il took it and used it for their own purposes, just sort of yeah. keeping the name and some of the principles. Was he was he really Kim Jong Il's mentor? He was because uh, Kim Jong Il attended Kim Il Sung University, and at that time Huang was the president of uh, Kim Il Sung University, and there were a couple of times where Kim Jong Il actually. Uh, got into trouble, you know, a few times, and then Hong Jiang Yup uh, sort of pulls him out of trouble, uh, you know, during his college or university days. And during the, you know, uh, I, I, we can say his mentor, he mentored Kim Jong Il, but I should say uh, Kim Jong Il really never listened to him in, in terms of Juche document, for instance. He just took it and you know uh totally revised it mm -hmm. in a sense that uh it's not quite what Wong had uh intended but uh yeah but you know and so actually you know he uh kim jong-il did ask Wong for uh, opinions and views on certain things so i call him a mentor but, but it, it uh, sounds almost more like he was uh, kim jong-il's protector or enabler more than an actual mentor in a way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, closer uh, to the reality than 
right. than the, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, I've heard some voices in South Korea who suggested that Huang, when he defected in 1997, should have been put on trial for what he did in North Korea rather than welcomed as a hero in Seoul. What do you make of that? Well, that's, that's a point of view. Uh, of course, he was part of that uh, regime and he was a very high uh, official. But for almost look, 50 years. Yeah, uh, but in terms of politics, he was more of a scholar and the academician than a politician. And I don't think he participated in any torture or any uh, oppressive you know, uh, events that uh, uh, the regime had participated. Uh, and, you know, sure, he was part of that terrible regime, uh, but the reason he defected was to correct that situation, whatever was going on at the time. And he believed that, uh, you know, Kim Jong-il uh, was about to go to war. And he knew uh, through his sources that Kim Jong-un had nuclear bombs at that time. And also at the same time, he, uh, uh, the starvation and the famine it just destroyed North Korea and he felt compelled to do something and he had to do something. And his, his motivation was there in that uh, side on that rather than, uh, you know, a bad guy from the North that it should be. But I don't know, that's a point of view I disagree with. And I think he, uh, his defection did a lot more for the overall, uh, you know, uh, attaining or maintaining peace mm. uh, in North Korea, uh, in, in the Korean Peninsula than otherwise. Could you tell a little bit more about that? How did his defection actually help the cause of peace on the Korean Peninsula? Well, uh, he uh, brought in, of course, the uh, CIA, you know, uh, vetted him considerably too. And he talked about the nuclear bomb and which, you know, nobody outside North Korea knew about. And he also knew how the North Korean regime ticked. And uh, the popular thought at that time was, uh, yeah, North Korea was based on Marxism and it was based on socialist, uh, socialism, blah, blah, blah. But the real uh, instrument, the way North Korea works is uh, Kim Il-sung's 10 principles. Right. And the, Hong is the first one to bring that, ah. to uh, bring it out to the world so that mm. uh, we could understand how uh, the Kim regime operated. And, right. and that way we're able to uh, respond or deal with them in a more meaningful way. And of course there are other people who claim uh, that, you know, they, they were responsible for peace right. uh, in the Korean Peninsula. I, I guess we can talk about that later. But because of Huang's uh, personal sacrifice, I should say, because, you know, his kids were, his daughter was killed, his wife committed suicide. I mean, there was tremendous cost. And he brought out uh, what, what I think is the, uh, the truth of how North Korea works. So that way, mm. uh, he was able to convince the... Uh, so let me interrupt this. So the um, okay. so, so Huang had this, uh, this Juche philosophy that he had come up with based on his understanding of, of humanism, of Kant, of Locke, etc. But then you just made a very brief mention of the, the 10 principles. And for our, our listeners there, that's the, uh, the 10 great principles for establishing a monolithic leadership ideology. I think I've got that right. Uh, yes. Which is, um, it's almost like the 10 commandments of North yes. Korea, which were written by, I think it's, it was a Kim Il-sung's uncle who had been a, a Methodist minister. He sort of wrote these 
as a, a way of solidifying the, the leadership ideology around Kim Il-sung uh, back in maybe the late 1950s, early 1960s. And certainly now those 10 principles are memorized by every adult North Korean, and they are the, uh, the foundational document of how North Korean people live their lives. And they are the basis for the weekly self-criticism and mutual criticism sessions. So that's the standard that they hold their lives up to, uh, not some airy-fairy, you know, vague Juche philosophy that's based on Kant and, and Locke or, uh, or Marx, Marxist-Leninism or any of that. It's these 10 principles, right? Yes, absolutely. You hit it right on the head. I mean, and, you, and you say Huang was the first one to bring that text out and to say, guys, listen, this is what it's all about. Forget right. what I wrote. It's these 10 principles. That's what's really the ruling ideology in North Korea. Right. Okay. That is the uh, modus operandi of North Korea. And, you know, that's, that's, he, that's part of the reasons why the famine came, uh, the total uh, inability to uh, the, uh, all the 10 principles, if you look at it, every one of those 10 principles uh, is based on praising and following Kim Il-sung. And that's it. Right. There is nothing else. And yeah. all, all, everything and anyone does in North Korea is because they, they have to do it for Kim Il-sung and in glory of Kim Il-sung. And mm -hmm. some yeah. say that, yeah, this was based on 10 commandments, mm -hmm. Christian 10 commandments. And, uh, and it, it kind of behaves like that. Right. Because as, as you say, you know, they have to memorize, everybody has to memorize in schools. And uh, if anyone who violates these 10 principles, they end up in, you know, jail. No, it, it's, or, it's, yeah. it's interesting as a foreigner visiting North Korea, I've been there a couple of times, and this document, these 10 principles are never mentioned. Never. They're never, never referred mentioned. to. Uh, and when I went there last time in, in 2019, I asked if I would be allowed to buy a copy of these 10 principles in a book and take them home to study. And I was told that, no, these are not available for outsiders. Right? So, it, so that it really is kind of like the, uh, uh, on the one hand, it's a foundational document, but also it's a document that's not open uh, to foreigners. Uh -oh. Uh, but oh, you, you, oh, you, you asked for you. Oh, asked I did. For, I specifically said oh. I went every bookshop I went to and my guides. Yeah. I said, hey, I'd like a copy of these 10 principles. And I was yeah. told no. Uh, and when I asked <laughs> my mail guide, I said, you know, why not? Why can't I have a copy? Because, you know, you'll let me buy the entire collected works of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. <laughs> why not a copy of these, you know, very small book of these 10 principles? And, and he said, um, I'm not sure I'll get back to you with an answer. And the next day he said to me, if you were a Korean and if you believed as we did, and if you were also a follower of Ju Chen Kim Il Song as we are, then you would be allowed to have a copy of these 10 principles. But because you are none of those things, this is not for you. Oh, uh, wow. Wow. Uh, but I, 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 can, I can give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say to our listeners, you can, in fact, find the entire text in Korean and in an English translation online. So it's not hard yeah. to find. Just, uh, just Google the, the 10 great principles. Right, right, right. Uh, right. I, I don't know why they made such a difficult thing about it. I mean, you can easily get it online, but uh, it's thanks to Huang. Uh, so in, in 1999, Huang published his Korean language memoir, The Story of His Life, uh, the book whose title translates to I Saw the Truth of History. Were, right. you ever, were you ever involved, John, in a project to translate all or some of that book and publish it in English? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's Chris. You're talking about Chris uh, and... Uh, Chris Green? Yeah, he, Chris Green. And this is a book. Ah, it's that's my the Korean favorite. book. Okay. Yeah, it's a Korean book. And uh, I uh, translate part of it uh, for Chris. Right. And uh, I think he... Uh, it hasn't come out in English yet. Right. But it you know should. what's become it of that should. project? It should come uh, out, right. It should. It's... Oh, definitely. And yeah. it's still in the progress. I mean, you know, process, I guess. Yep. And uh, 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 Chris is the uh, right guy to do it because he, he you know, he's, he knows a lot. And uh, the, uh, the portion that I translated is uh, his personal 
just before he defected, he and his wife had a meeting ah. in a, in the backyard. Yeah, and Huang he took all the papers he ever created and burned it in the backyard. And while he was burning, his wife comes out and says, "Oh, what are you doing?" And she thought. Uh, this was very strange. They had met at University of Moscow, and uh, right. uh, but anyway, she was quite a, a brilliant person herself, and she knew right away something was happening. Yeah, and so she started a conversation in Russian, so that you know to to avoid the uh, so no uh, listening ears could listen in on right, what they were right, saying. Right, right, and so uh, he didn't tell her, but. That he was going to defect, Ooh. and because if he did, she would be, she would be, uh, you know, implied as, as a conspirator and so right. on and so forth. So, but she knew because of that conversation in Russian, talked about you know Huang sort of, and that's as part that conversation is in this book. Oh, and so you know that's that's the part I uh, translated. Gosh. <laughs> You met Huang a number of times uh, yeah. here um, between 2004 and 2010. W would you say that you became friends with Huang? Yeah, I, I became one of his students. Uh, I, you know, he, uh, I, I saw his vision, and his vision was to democratize North Korea, and he said that that was the only way. Uh, forget this planned economy, forget the socialism. Uh, in fact, the first thing he said when he defected, uh, he said he sent a message to Kim, Kim Jong-il. He says, socialism is dead. Mm. And, and he, he was determined to introduce democracy into North Korea, and that was the only way uh, North Korea could survive uh, as as people. Did he not see? Was he not afraid that democratization of North Korea would lead to an entire systemic collapse and ultimately a swallowing up of uh, of North Korea and absorption into South Korea? Well, yeah, he, uh, that was uh, his vision too. Huh. That South Korea should be part of that. South Korea should invest in North Korean and run it, you know, like uh, the way, you know, Samsung and Hyundai and the way, that the way it should uh, should be run so that it would produce, uh, yeah, he mm -hmm. to see that. And his uh, ultimate goal was to uh, was regime change because yeah. he, he knew it was impossible to introduce democracy, uh, you know, a, a, as long as the Kim family uh, was in there. Right. He knew that very personally. Yeah. Now, just over 11 years ago, Huang Zhang Yop died in Seoul on the 10th right. of October 2010. Now, the 10th of October is a special day in North Korea. It's their uh, Korean Workers' Party Foundation Day. They often have some kind of commemorative or celebratory event on that day. I understand that he died in his bath in Seoul and that an autopsy yeah. was revealed no poison or drugs and there was no sign of forced entry into his home. However, there had been some arrests of people uh, who had intended to assassinate Huang and who had come to right. South Korea on false pretenses, pretending to be Talbukja pretending to be defectors from North Korea, but actually intending to uh, to kill Huang. Uh, yeah, it was um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, that and, was and, attempts. Yeah. And and he he would he would not if they'd succeeded he would not have been the only person that that had happened to right. There was a uh, an in law of um, of the Kim family who had defected to South Korea and written a uh, quite a, a scurrilous uh, scandalous book about uh, the Kim dynasty, uh, and he was shot dead outside his apartment in Bundang, only a matter of days after uh, Huang entered the South Korean embassy in Beijing. So, you know, it's, it's not it's not impossible for uh, for North Korea to reach out and and uh, 
kill you know, defectors uh, in South Korea. So do you believe Huang died a natural death? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I was, uh, you know, of course, very interested in the uh, how, you know, how he died. And yeah, I, I believe he uh, died, uh, you know, natural death. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's just a coincidence that he died on uh, the Korean Workers' Party Foundation Day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, uh, uh, I don't know. It's uh, memorable, I guess. Yeah. 10, 10, 10. Yes. You know, yeah. and, and if he died in, at 10 a.m., that would be even worse. I mean, even worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But. Right. And then just uh, over a year after Huang's death, uh, his mentee, his student, Kim Jong il, died. Uh, and then you published this book in 2012. Now's a great time to hold it up and show the camera. Oh, exit Emperor Kim Jong Il notes from his former mentor, uh, based on uh, on Huang's memoirs and based on on your interviews with him. Uh, people could find it online. Tell us a little bit about that book. What will people learn from it? I published it. I, in fact, I intended to have it to publish it while Kim Jong-il was alive. But, you know, it was inconvenient. Uh, he died before it was yeah. published. So, I, <laughs> inconveniently. So, Would it have had a different uh, title if you'd published it before he died? Uh, probably, yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I had to go back to the manuscript and change everything to past tense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, it, uh, I, I worked it with, uh, Mrs. Hun Kwang Ju. Mrs. Hun is uh, he's my co-author, and he helped me a great deal. But anyway, he was Mr. Huang's academic secretary for 13 years, and he had a lot of information. And you'll get to, I hope you get to meet him someday. And uh, anyway, the, the book itself uh, shows how Kim Jong-il elevated into power in North Korea. And, you know, how, how vicious, vicious he is, really. And or was past tense. Or now. was, yeah, yeah. I was. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was thinking about Kim Jong un again. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, Kim Jong un sort of has to follow the footstep of what's uh, engraved into people's minds for 70, 80 years. Mm. And Kim Jong un, you know, when he first came in, into uh, limelight, everybody said, oh yeah, he was educated in Swiss and he should know about this and know about that. Not true. Even if he knew about it, he couldn't do anything uh, about transfer. I mean, there were people, you know, had high hopes for reforming and yeah. blah, blah, blah. But uh, the, uh, he had to follow what people have been following for 70 years. I mean, he can't, he can't. So in this book, uh, it, it talks about how Kim Jong-il, uh, the pro uh, progression of how he came into power and it should explain what Kim Jong-un can do, what he can't do. And it should, you know, the uh, understanding of the Kim Jong-un would be made better by, by this book. That's okay. what I think. So it's, it's still relevant now, it, almost 10 yeah, years later. I think so, yeah. And because uh, generally a lot of, I wrote it for, you know, for people to understand North Korean regime mm -hmm. the way it is. I, I try to do it in a, in a uh, very easy language for, to understand, but the, uh, it is relevant, germane, for mm. to understand uh, the way regime operates today. Do you feel that Hwang jong yop uh, when he came to South Korea and, and when he wrote his book and when you met him, did he tell a different story about himself? Did he polish his story up and, and make himself look better than you know, or more important or more influential um, or you know, less tainted by his involvement with the North Korean regime? Uh, hmm. Good question. He, uh, what he did was he had written about 27 books and he burnt it all before he came. 
whatever he had, the manuscript and what. And he recreated these books by memory. And he wrote down, but I, I, I am I'm inclined to think that he had to change some of the things mm. for, for the South Korean audience. Mm. Uh, because, you know, South Korean audience, they don't understand, you know, a lot of things, although they, you know, they claim they do. So uh, I think he, he did probably adjust. And there were editors who helped him, uh, like uh, Son, my, my co-author, mm -hmm. uh, helped him uh, change it into South Korean language. But that's talking more to... about his philosophy. I'm just sort of talking about oh. himself and his own story. Did he, you know, was he completely honest? Uh, do you think um, people have a tendency to tell different stories depending on where they are or different narratives of, of, of who they are? Oh, I see. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Uh, I, I, I think I believe what he's, you know, he talks about when he talks about his uh, defection and his uh, situation, I, I think he's right telling the truth uh, because while he was, you know, locked up in Beijing, I mean, he, he wasn't, he was there for months uh, in South Korean embassy uh, because, you know, North Korean security, you know, the boy people, they try to climb the wall into the uh, embassy, compound to assassinate him. And so, you know, he and Kim Do Kong both were locked up for about, what is it, I forget, three months, three, yeah. And all their, you know, windows were boarded up. And so basically it was a prison for him. Uh, and what he says is that I don't care what happens to me. And he said he always uh, carried a cyanide pill in his pocket, shirt wow. pocket. And once he got that, he somehow got that through, you know, through uh, South Korean security people. Once he got it, he felt so comfortable. He felt at peace. And, that's, you know, and he told me that. And he also writes that in the, uh, in the book. And Comfortable, so, you mean, because he felt he could take his own life at any moment if he had to. Right. He was, he felt that was the first time he felt at peace and he was no longer, you know, anxious, you know, about the whole situation. You know, anything happens, I'm going to take my sign of pill and that's the end of it. So uh, when, you know, when a person goes through and makes that kind of uh, determination about his own life, uh, I got to think that, you know, he, he's, talking, telling tell the truth. I mean, he, uh, this, he's, he's concerned about his own, his entire life and his legacy and mm -hmm. what would I be remembered for? And I got, I got to think that he is, you know, there are a lot of uh, theories out there. Some people, you know, he was this, he was that. Uh, he left his family behind yeah. and to save himself and all that. But you know, yeah, it's I, I understand all those talks, but ultimately, I think he uh, he did it for uh, sanity. Uh, he did it for uh, the Korean people as a whole. Did you get a sense when you met him that he was still? I mean, you met him in you know um, seven years after his defection. Did you get a sense that he was troubled by? what had happened to his family, what position he'd put his wife and children in, in, in leaving North Korea? Oh, yeah. He felt very guilty about it. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, every day, uh, I mean, his wife committed suicide, uh, his daughter. Uh, now, how do we know this, by the way? Oh, he, he also had information uh, ways to get his information through uh, South Korean intelligence people or and and both. He had his, still had his own uh -huh. uh, people in the uh, his his uh, uh, influence or sphere of influence. Yeah. And 
you know, they say that when he defected, uh, the Kim regime took and rounded up about 8,000 people mm. and, you know, and took them to, you know, concentration camp to camps and so on. Uh, but he still had uh, loyal people, uh, mm. you know, along the way. And he got his information through them. And mm. it seemed like, I mean, he, he was up on all the information. Yeah. I was surprised at times uh, because Mr. Pack, Young Pack, was concerned about finding his brother. And Young Pack asked Mr. Huang about uh, whether his brothers were alive or dead. And uh, at that time, uh, the North Korean uh, Hoibu, you know, they were sending mm. Young Pack pictures of his younger brother yeah oh. he's alive and blah 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 and send us money send us money right he, he, keep you can sending his money but Huang said eventually yeah i found out that y- your brothers are dead wow and mm. don't send them any money anymore um, it's always interesting to me uh how both sides seem to know more about the other than you would expect i mean as you say here uh uh, Huang was able to find out living in South Korea what had happened to his his wife and his family, his children, yeah. his family. Uh, and similarly, uh, I had a, a guest on the podcast a while ago who was um, uh, visiting uh, both South Korea and North Korea. And while he was in South Korea, he had a secret meeting in an undisclosed location with Huang Jung Yop. You know, it was not in a public place and. He didn't even know where he was because he switched cars a number of times and was being driven to a secret location and, and met Huang. And then a few days later, he was in North Korea and the North Koreans said to him, so we understand you met Huang when you were in Seoul. And he's like, well, how do they know that? You know, it, it, always, it amazes me. And then I, I once knew a, um, an American man, he's, he's since passed away, but he had married a North Korean defector. Uh, and he said they had a, uh, a, uh, an unlisted uh, home phone number uh, and they would get f- threatening phone calls from people with North Korean accents, you know, saying, well, we know who you are and, you know, we know how to get to you. And you always wonder, well, how, how's that getting up there? So it, it does seem sometimes that the in- the border for information is a bit more porous than you would expect. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I believe that Huang was involved in setting up a kind of North Korean government in exile with other elite defectors, intellectuals and so on. What did you know about these efforts and, and what, yeah, we'll start with that. Well, he, uh, well, what he told me was, you know, uh, the exile, government in exile, it's kind of ridiculous because I am in South Korea now and South Korea is also my country. And why would I send and set up an exile government? And there were a lot of people, you know, in, in the States mostly, uh, some people wanted, you know, Hong to set up an exile government, but he refused them all. Uh, he didn't see much sense in that. Oh, okay. So he wasn't involved in an exile no. government then. Okay. No, no. But he did link up with other uh, um, you know, prominent. Uh, there was one guy, I, I'm not sure if he's still alive. Um, he was a secretary to the South Korean domestic communist leader, Park Hon Yong. Mm. Um, and had left North Korea during the very first purges in the 1950s after the Korean War uh, and had himself smuggled to Japan, to Tokyo. Um, I may still have his book around here somewhere. Yeah, what was his name? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of what, oh. where is that book? Ah, here we go. Pak Gap Dong. Ah, oh, Pak Gap Dong, yeah. Pak Gap okay. Dong, uh, who wrote a, a book only Printed once in the 1990s called uh, Pyongyang, Seoul, Pyongyang, Bukyong, Dongyong. Yeah, have you read that? I haven't read it. No, I will now. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very interesting book, which also should be translated into English because there's nothing known about, very little known about Pak Up Dong uh, in English. Uh, but That's I right. understand that, that he and Huang were in talks together, if not about a government in exile, then certainly in, uh, uh, you know, an intellectual network of uh, elite defectors from the top levels. Yes, uh, they did. You know, there's some 
you know, theories or talk about Huang was, you know, going to do a coup. Right. Uh, with the uh, with different different what, factions, but yeah, uh, defectors, and also he had some uh, people inside North Korea. Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, I, I, he, he, I wasn't part of that conversation. Okay. Uh, Did you think that had I, any realistic hopes of going anywhere? I don't think so. Okay. I, uh, because that would take a tremendous. Uh, you know, infrastructure, and mm. it would take tremendous coordination. And because Hong was, you know, in South Korea, he was almost a captive himself in South Korea, because Kim Dae-jung government kept a real close eye on him. Uh, in fact, when I was in uh, interviewing, when I was in his office interviewing him, you know, I mean, the they they were listening to everything we're yeah. doing i'm sure the you know it's it's the file is in there somewhere right but anyway i did bring up uh kim dae jung uh once and he almost went uh he almost went pale and he grabbed his chair and it shook literally shook and he said that's the end of this interview wow and yeah huh. and we ended the interview right there Gee. and so you know i can i can sort of glean what you know he was going through at the time and when kim dae-jung went to north korea to pyongyang to meet with kim jong-il mm -hmm. Uh, he, the one thing he feared most was that Kim jong il was going to ask Kim dae jung to give up Hong. Ah. And then Kim dae jung was going to uh, go ahead and turn him back, you know, send him back. And, uh, and he, he was fearful of that. And, you know, and he, he was not free to do what he thought he could do in South Korea. Mm. Uh, the, uh, when he uh, uh, went to Washington, D.C. to meet with people and so on and so forth, and that, that they didn't want to do that. And uh, in fact, North Korea uh, broke his son's leg, you know, to warn Huang mm. not to say anything. And, you know, uh, in fact, his son uh, actually wanted to come to America to study. And Young Pak, he was going to help him, mm. bring him over to, uh, to uh, America to study. Mm. And, but anyway, the, uh, they kept real tight rein on him and he wasn't free to move around. And he finally came, you know, to Washington uh, during the Muyun era. So Huang Jiang yeop did or, or his son did? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Huang Jiang yeop did. Okay. Do we know what happened uh, to his son in the end? Uh, I, we think they kept him alive. Hmm. But, you know, as a, uh, that was 19, no, that was till, uh, Huang uh, died. I, I don't know what happened after. Right. After that, right. I don't have any information yeah. uh, uh, about his son. But uh, mm. he, Huang, was, you know, what he was uh, having a real hard time was his yeah. grandson. And he said, he said, you know, he thought about his grandson every day. Mm. And that was the hardest part of his uh, defection. <laughs> And I, I, I can see why. Yeah. yeah. I understand I understand that. Yeah. Now, I understand that these days you're involved in activism for North Korean human rights among the Korean American community. Um what what can you tell us about the Korean American community and uh, attitudes towards North Korea? Yeah, uh I, I guess you could call it activism, but 
you know, it, it was uh, Mr. Huang who steered me and he said, well, you asked me, you know, shouldn't be doing something, you know, <laughs> I said, okay, I will do something. So, you know, I helped him with his cause, uh, bringing democracy to North Korea. And there's a group of us who do that. And uh, Kim Jong-un was one of them and he's doing it. And, you know, I, I was helping him and actually, uh, in America, people are sort of divided. Mm. Those who are, you know, the one 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 side of them, one side of the uh, people are they are veterans from Korean War, and so they hate communists and everything they do is, and you know, and they they denounce Moon Moon Jae In right now, right. you know, because Moon Jae In is too soft. Uh, uh, Moon Jae in is a poor communist, and so on and so forth. That's one side. Right. The other side, you know, and they 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 feel like, you know, they Moon Jae in is the right thing. You know, soft approach and sunshine uh, policy is the uh, proper way to go. And so it's it's, it's divided. Yeah. And where do you, you fit know, on that spectrum? I I would uh, probably go towards more. Uh, to the uh, well, uh, I'm not pro Moon Jae In, if you ask me. Uh, in fact, uh, I write you know things about him that are not very well known. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, things that uh, everybody should be careful of. And I like to think I am on the side of the truth, but. People call me, I'm an extreme right. Ah. <laughs> and hey, you know, what the heck. What do you hope Korean American activists can achieve in relation to North Korea? Basically, what we can do is the uh, tell, tell the situation, tell the truth, and work for, you know, uh, humanity on, on the human rights of North Korea. And my ultimate uh, uh, vision is to bring democracy to North Korea, like, like Huang's. But mm -hmm. we under, I understand it's a long shot. Mm. It's, uh, I hope it happens someday, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Yeah. So basically, what we can do is we can alert, uh, make people aware what they're up against in terms of. Uh, you know, bringing or how we can help uh, people of North Korea and and we, we can poke holes in North Korean propaganda. And, we, you know, and that's how uh, our, our, and also we're bringing uh, North Korean uh, defector students, uh, mm. college students, we're bringing them over to uh, give them English uh, language training and in America. In America, right? So we're doing that and uh, to broaden their education. Last question, John. Now that Huang Jung Yop is no longer alive and Kim Jong Il is also now dead. Uh, who do you believe could be a force for change in North Korea? Do you see anyone that gives you hope? No, I, I don't see anyone. I, I don't see anyone that, you know, that, that is as provident as uh, Mr. Hong. Mm. And what he left behind is a group of people uh, who, who would continue uh, to uh, his vision. and. It's, it's uh, looking more like, but we, we are all sort of like underground at the moment uh, because uh, the moon government, moon government is not, you know, is not, uh, they try very hard to paint a different picture or a bad picture about uh, any activists mm -hmm. that are from North and also uh, from the South. And, uh, 
but I'm hoping that the uh, next administration, maybe, and some of the, a lot of people that were in front of uh, doing th things for North Korea, they're all in jail now. Mm. And the uh, maybe when they get out of jail, or maybe the South Korean government administration you know, gets a new leadership or a new administration that are not so sympathetic towards North, uh, we can, we can uh, find some, uh, some light at yeah. the end of the tunnel. I don't know if I can say all these things on your program, but. <laughs> sure, I mean, you know, as we, you know uh, th these opinions are your own, of course, John, yeah, and uh, yeah, they do not course. necessarily express the editorial opinion of, uh, of NK News or the podcast. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show, John Haksung Cha. It's been a great pleasure to talking to you. Uh, don't forget, listeners, you can find books written and translated by searching for John online at, with the name John H. Cha, and his 2012 book is Exit Emperor Kim Jong-il. Um, so that's there online. Thanks so much for coming on the show, John. Thank you for having me, Jaco, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you already have an NK News subscription, take a look at our NK Pro platform, which offers unparalleled services specifically catered to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. Inquire about access at membership at nknews.org today. Also, if you have feedback, questions, or guest recommendations, please send them to podcast at nknews.org. Now, thanks as always to Arias Dare and Brian Betts for facilitating this podcast and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. Thanks for listening again next time. Bye.